Hello, everyone. Thank you for stopping into this session today. I encourage you in the chat to introduce yourself, tell us your role, and where are you joining us from? I think the very first session I was in, I feel like I had at least 25 different countries, which was phenomenal when you can gather such a uh, worldwide audience in one space is always exciting before we even start talking about the content at hand. So please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. I'm Angela from the Seesaw team, and we welcome you to Empowering Multilingual Learners, Tools and Strategies for Growth. Today, we have three amazing leaders with us that will engage in our discussion. During the session, we encourage you to take notes, type in the chat, be active while you're learning. Remember that you can get points on our leaderboard for being active. In the top right, you'll see that chat option for entering um, any comments you have or introducing yourselves. There's also a Q&A tab that you can put your questions in. And at the end of our time today, we'll reserve about 10 or so minutes for going live and asking questions to our panelists here today. and. If you need closed captioning, please select the CC in the top right corner and choose your preferred language. At the very end of the session, I'm also going to do two giveaways for Seesaw Gear. So without further ado, I want to introduce our amazing panelists today. First, I'm going to start with Kia Myrick McDaniel, a lifelong educator committed to promoting equitable educational opportunities for culturally and li linguistically diverse students. Her extensive and varied background includes roles as a classroom teacher, reading specialist, ESOL teacher, instructional specialist, supervisor, director of curriculum and instruction, and consultant, which of course provides her with a comprehensive understanding of the educational landscape. She is driven by a deep commitment to social justice and equipped with a wealth of educational knowledge, Dr. McDaniel is a respected thought leader and advocate for educational equity. Her contributions to the field ensure that all students have access to the opportunities they deserve. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Excited to be here with you all. Next up, I'm going to introduce Bridget. She is a digital learning consultant for Grant Wood Area Education Agency in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Her role is to serve educators and students in seven Iowa counties of approximately 72,000 students with digital technology integration, universal design for learning strategies, accessibility, and K-12 computer science education, she has experience in early childhood and elementary classrooms, and she began using one-to-one -one devices in the elementary classroom over 13 years ago, realizing the potential for technology and for inclusive education practices. She is dedicated to helping educators, students, and families use technology to enhance engagement, access to materials, and student expression of learning. Welcome, Bridget. Hey, everyone. And Cheryl Carter is a 24-year veteran K-2 teacher who has over seven years of experience being an ed tech coach and digital coordinator. She is an early CESA adopter from the greater San Francisco Bay Area. She is also a CESA certified educator and the CESA admin in her district. Cheryl is an advocate for balanced approach to technology use in the classroom, focusing on the KTK to grade level in her district. Outside of education, Cheryl is a wife and mother of two amazing kids, one who graduated from high school and the other from college. Her family raises service dog puppies in training, and she participates in versatility ranch horse competitions. Wow. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Welcome to Seesaw Connect. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We are so excited to have this discussion today. I am going to kick things off with our first question that really focuses on that inclusive environment that we all want to create in our classrooms. What are some key strategies you have implemented to create an inclusive educational environment for multilingual learners? 
So I'll start with that. Um, I obviously you want to think first about the physical environment for students and what we're creating. So of course you want to have lots of visuals, pictures, labels, charts, and those are great resources, but we want to make sure that we also don't overdo it and overwhelm students so that they are overstimulated um, by what's going on in the classroom. But just having that um, visually appealing environment that really consists of resources they can use in the classroom, that there are hands-on opportunities for students to learn. And when we're thinking about the grouping, um, to make sure that all of our students are engaged. So students don't have to just be grouped with students that have, are the same language proficiency as them. They don't have to just be students with a uh, group with students who are coded as a language learner. They should be interacting with everyone in the class, um, but you'll have different grouping for different um, situations. Um, also, just thinking um, about the language demands of the lessons, making sure that there are language objectives um, so that you as a teacher know what you're observing, what type of language are you expecting students um, to use. Because if it's not at the front of our brains as we're planning those lessons, then sometimes that language aspect slips away and we want to make sure that's a, a focus for our multilingual learners. And of course, um, time for educators to um, get together, to collaborate, to think about their support for multilingual learners. And so every educator that touches our students who are multilingual learners should have the opportunity to engage with one another from our classroom teachers, our specialists, our speech language pathologists, our physical education teachers, every teacher that works with students to think about the language um, that they are using their classrooms, what they're seeing across classes to be able to um, support students or just some of the things to help create that inclusive environment. So um, the first thing that really comes to my mind um, when I'm thinking of multilingual learners in the classroom is that technology has opened so many doors for our multilingual learners. Um, when I first entered the classroom, there were a lot of barriers for the teacher and the student or the teacher and the parents. So when I think of the basics of how we support multilingual learners, having the right tools um, in place like Seesaw, for example, can tear down those barriers. With built-in translation features, families are in the loop no matter what their primary language at home is. And students can use video and audio, voice recording, icons, and all these embedded supports. Um, the multimodal tool is just one way that we can go beyond paper and pencil activities. Um, you can create two-way opportunities and teachers can record themselves and then the students can record their answers back. So there's lots of language modeling in that approach. Um, and then the student has agency to choose the tool that they are comfortable with. Um, we don't have to put them into like the cookie cutter language um, approach. We can allow them access to what they're comfortable with. Great ideas. Bridget, what would you say? Well, I agree with both ladies, like visuals and just that immersive opportunity. Um, there's a lot of brain research about the power of images, drawings, um, and things that connect with all kids, not just our English language learners. My other advocacy is when you're thinking of um, inclusive environments, is that universal design for lear learning and designing with empathy. So finding out more about that child and what they prefer. We all can find the sports kids or the drawing kids and then using that as a tool to show how they can be successful even without that language barrier. Yeah, and I think actually a lot of what you're saying feeds into my next question. So I'll let you kind of start off, Bridget. But the question is, how do you ensure that your instructional practices are culturally responsive and inclusive of the diverse backgrounds of multilingual learners? So I think you have to go a proactive approach. So you have to know and dig deep into your students, but also the families. Like one of my experiences in the school I taught at before doing this position was we had over 30 languages and that was challenging. But then finding out were even the families literate in their native language, you know, can they even read a translation or is oral better for even those families and then those kids? 
Um, so really, really thinking about every little lesson, every little thing, and what might be, as uh, Cheryl said, what are some barriers that might be in the way for the student, the family, even the teacher or teachers to um, that will inhibit the child, will inhibit their learning. Mm -hmm. So those are those are big things that should be in part of the the planning process and the coaching process for those teachers. It's not always there. It's a reactive approach. I, I completely agree, Bridget. You definitely have to know your students and learn as much about them as you can. And that's not always like a formal survey or tell me about this stuff. Lots of that comes out um, as you're engaged with your students over the year, as you hear them engaging um, with one another, but just letting them express themselves um, so that you can learn more about their, their backgrounds really helps to um, ensure that cultural competence takes place in the, the classroom. Of course, when applicable, allowing students to use their native language in the classroom with one another, whether it's or in their writing. Um, and sometimes that just gives them that, they gives them that opportunity to respond and express themselves. And then, you know, sometimes the teacher serves as a student as students are explaining to you what they wrote in, in their native language. Um, and of course, we want to have those materials in the classroom that reflect our student population, um, whether it be the, the characters and the text they're reading, whether it be, um, you know, the history that they're, they're reading about, um, just so, so they can see themselves in the classroom. But we don't have to stop there. Like, we want students to even see uh, populations that are not represented in the classroom so that they can just be exposed to a variety of different cultures, demographics, and, and different ideas. I love that Kia mentioned talking in native languages because I have a really great example of an experience in a classroom that I have that was really eye-opening for me and for the classroom teacher. Um, I was in a second grade classroom and the student that I was working with was a newcomer and we were working um, on in Seesaw and the um, this uh, student spoke Spanish in, in, in their home and um, I told him to tell the teacher in Spanish on Seesaw um, and he like, go ahead and record yourself. And he looked at me funny, like what? And I have a little bit of Spanish. So I was able to explain to him, no, it's okay. You don't have to translate, just record yourself. You understand what's going on. Tell the teacher in Spanish. And he had this look like I was crazy. <laughs> but then as soon as he did it, he lit up. He was excited because he has knowledge in his head and it was just language bound, but the knowledge was still there. And for him to be able to speak in Spanish validated his learning was still happening. And I think that was really powerful for his teacher and for the student to understand that language is just the barrier that's not allowing us to see what's happening, but it's still happening. Um, and this idea about everything having to be perfect we have to put to the side. Things get sticky, learning gets sticky. And when you have newcomers or uh, multilingual learners in your classroom, you have to realize that it's not gonna be perfect. And some of the best learning happens when um, things aren't perfect. And this example is a prime, a prime uh, reason for it. So I think the biggest piece is validate. Validate the fact that learning's still happening regardless of the language. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and, and Cheryl, you, in your, in your example, you really highlighted the fact that they had a tool that the student could record their, their voice in um, and explain, which brings on our next question that I wanna talk about is the use of multimodal instruction. And specifically, let's discuss the role of multimodal tools in supporting multilingual learners. And what have you found most effective in your practice? Yeah, we're, we're uh, despite the headlines, we're really lucky to be teaching in 2024 um, with all of the tools that are available to us to really reach students and reach them where they are. And those tools that provide scaffolding to help students 
um, really take them to the next level with both their language and their content are really important and have really seen lots of gains, um, you know, utilizing those tools that meet students where, where they are. And of course, you know, when you have a classroom of students, whether that be 20 students, 25 students, 30 students, um, just knowing what's available to help your students grow, to provide them with the extra um, practice um, really gives you um, the, the opportunity to push students to the next level without a lot of additional preparation um, from the teacher for every every single lesson, every single um, piece of content. And of course, like using all of these tools allows our students to get that practice that they need within all four domains of language. So we sometimes live in reading and writing, but there are four domains of, of language, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And so just uh, allowing um, students to engage in multimodal tools definitely gives them that practice across all of the, the language areas. I think building on what uh, Kia just was mentioning about the uh, four language domains um, is really important with respect to multimodal tools. Um, it gives us insight into our students' abilities, whether they be language um, learning, uh, in the classroom learning English um, as another language, or if um, we're looking at just all of our gen ed population, our special ed population, it is a peek into the brain when you're looking at multimodal tools. Um, so for one example, when we're looking at multilingual learners, we might be learning about the life cycle um, of uh, plants or animals, and the student may not be able to write about that. Frequently we say, write about it now that you've learned it. Um, but instead, in the multimodal world, we can have students manipulate images to show what they know, and they don't have to necessarily be able to talk about it. They may not have the vocabulary yet to talk about that mm -hmm. or the sentence structure, the grammar. Um, there are ways in math, too, with multimodal tools so that you can see the actual math process happening. Um, and again, they may not be able to speak about it, but we can gather insights beyond um, their their work and gather more information rather than just paper and pencil um, information input. Um, I have really two amazing examples um, about language learners um, that I have experienced. One um, is a new newcomer named Stacy who came to our district this last school year, and she was very reluctant to speak, reluctant to engage with her computer. Really wasn't very happy being in school, and she immediately warmed up when she discovered that she could record video in Seesaw. Mm -hmm. Yes, she was very dramatic. And we have video of her doing her newcomer lessons and she was exuberantly shouting on the playground while being recorded in Seesaw, I am swinging! This is a girl who when she first came into class wouldn't even talk, wouldn't make eye contact. But as soon as she became an actress, on a video in Seesaw, she started using language and it was an amazing situation to experience. I have a similar situation with a young man named Santiago who was in a class of all girl newcomers and very reluctantly like would not speak because he was afraid that he was gonna make a mistake in front of the girls. And when he realized he could record himself, he would record his voice. It was energizing for him. So he would start recording, listen, and then he would go, no, 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 that's wrong. And he would re-record himself. We actually had to stop him from re-recording himself because he was doing it repetitively, but he was so exciting. It was, it was just, it, it was fun, it was engaging. Both of these students were practicing. They were practicing and practicing through their own um, student agency, the tool that they chose that was multimodal. And we were able to get them to come out of a shell and start participating fully in their language instruction. And it was amazing. It was just magical. I love those stories. I think that really, really makes the classroom come to life and the power of having a tool available that can bring the student's strengths to the forefront is really, really impressive. I want to talk a little bit more about engagement and participation with our multilingual learners. What techniques do you use in your classrooms to encourage active participation and engagement from multilingual learners? 
Bridget, I'm going to let you start okay. first. Um, so in that designing process, I think you have to um, really think about the barriers and that planning routine. And then um, think about the strength of vocabulary and using multiple uh, modalities, both in how students express uh, that vocabulary, but also how you're giving vocabulary opportunities to them. Um, you, you may not see it, but I talk a lot with my hands and there is brain research about the, the power of, it's called co-gesturing, where you are using um, not only oral, so thinking about vocabulary in English, but also maybe in that native language so that they're making those connections. Um, but then the visuals that Kia mentioned earlier, and then co-gesturing, can there be some actions associated with it? Because then that will just be another modality because modalities don't just need to be tech um, that kids can really grasp onto. Um, so, and then when you talk about the videoing so that they can go back over and over at their own time and place, or could they then create those videos? So I think really being mindful about um, what kind of ways do kids get involved within um, the, the language itself and pair it with their own native language is huge. And um, with the last conversation too, it also, when you're using all of these things, it's good for all learners. Um, we have some situations where some of our ELL learners are also on the autism spectrum. So when you are dealing with students that have um, multiple uh, learning needs, then it's really important. How can one thing impact all areas and remove barriers for all of them? And then they're not so isolated. They don't look different than anybody else that's doing a videotape or you have the vocabulary all around the room um, and letting them choose the picture. I saw student choice and voice, super huge. Sometimes we choose the picture and it doesn't really represent kids or meaning to them. So that's huge. And Bridget, you just gave me the permission I need to keep moving my hands over here as I talk, because I, I, I too speak with, with my hands. And so I know we really have to be, when we think about the techniques to use um, for participation, really be intentional about giving students the time to think and prepare and respond to the questions that are being posed to them. So I know sometimes um, we wanna make sure every, we have equal participation in the classroom. So we might have those randomizers that have everyone's name in them, but that think about how stressful that is um, for our students who are acquiring language, who just really wanna have that processing time and think about if we, give them that appropriate amount of time and then they can volunteer um, to participate or maybe allowing students to just share in a small group with um, a small group or with a partner so they're not presenting in front of the whole class. They have time to continue to process while a partner might be speaking or, or a group member might be speaking and then they can um, share information. And as we talked about, um, but can't say it enough, students just need multiple ways to be able to engage and share what they know. And so they can write, they can record a video, record their voice, take a photo, do a drawing, just thinking about all the different um, opportunities that we can give students to show what they know. Um, they, they will really help to lower the effective filter uh, for our students as they're processing language. Those are all amazing examples um, and eye-opening ideas with respect to the, the general ed classroom. And I wanna actually talk about what our district does with our newcomers. Um, we treat our newcomer population a little differently. And what we do is we have special time with small group instruction where the students leave the gen ed classroom. We know that a lot of times language development happens better when it's not as threatening as a full classroom. So while our students are in a gen ed classroom and they're learning with their peers and they're developing relationships with their teachers, at the same time, they also have daily pullout. And it's very short, but it allows them 
a way to get comfortable with developing language production. It's also a time for specialized um, lessons. We're uh, teaching them how to interact with uh, the tips and tricks and tools and things that they come engaged with in a, in a school setting. Um, we're teaching them that working BICS vocabulary so that they're comfortable on the playground, in the cafeteria. And it, this protected space really gives them confidence when they return to the classroom. This is exactly where uh, my two prior examples of Santiago and Stacy came from. And that was where we were using Seesaw's multimodal tools to um, get them uh, just more comfortable with the language and being confident amongst their peers and with their teachers. And let's, I, I think you bring up a really great population to focus on for a moment, the, the newcomers. So these are multilingual learners, that are just starting their journey. And, uh, you know, maybe they're in their classroom learning English for the very first time. What, what else should we understand about this stage in language development? Um, well, it's definitely important to remember that even if students aren't speaking, um, that they are still learning. They are still acquiring the language. So they might be in a silent phase, but they are still acquiring the language by what they're hearing um, and that they oftentimes can show you what they know um, versus being able to tell you initially. And so don't um, be discouraged because the students will be, will be talking shortly, they'll be engaging um, shortly in, in our standard ways that we see across the classroom. Um, and of course, with our newcomers, we wanna make sure that we have the appropriate materials um, and resources to support them. And so we always have to think about what materials, no matter what grade level you teach, um, what materials do we have that can support those foundational skills that we want students to um, engage in and just having those resources available for students at all levels of uh, language acquisition is definitely key. I agree. There are some amazing resources available to support the language development of newcomers. Um, my district was involved in testing the newcomer and the ELD curriculum um, that Seesaw has recently created. And we discovered all kinds of neat things during this work time with Seesaw. The ELD curriculum has three levels of WIDA within their content area topics. So you can pretty much target level one, level two um, for, um, I'm sorry, you can target um, different levels of, of WIDA for your uh, different content areas, um, depending on where your kids are um, needing uh, support. We even had the level three uh, students with uh, English only students, because we found that they even were learning and developing their grammar and their skills language-wise and content area um, as a language learner themselves. Um, so you can pretty much um, pull groups and you can pull them to the back table. You can unpack vocabulary. They can listen. They can practice speaking and utilizing uh, academic vocabulary. Um, the other thing that I really like is you could do it as a preview. You could do it as a mid chapter uh, or a mid uh, unit um, check in, you could do it as a, a recheck at the end to make sure they're picking up vocabulary. So there's lots of options there. And the scaffolds are amazing. Seesaw has embedded them. There's plenty of opportunities to um, build upon skills for newcomers and for just our, our multilingual learners. And, and Cheryl, I just want to mention too, for, for everyone that's here, when she mentions the newcomer lessons, those are available to anyone that's in Seesaw. You can dive in. Can you give us a little bit more about the format or what, what, what those lessons are like for the student? Well, first and foremost, they um, mirror uh, all of the good teaching in the Seesaw Library created from Seesaw. Um, so there's a lot of lessons that will begin with a video. The videos are professionally done and they are amazing because they're not two-dimensionally flat like a book, but now you have action, you have experiences with vocabulary where it provides something to scaffold to, to hook to. It's that anticipatory set if we go way back in our teaching world. <laughs> and they're realistic uh, representations of whatever's being taught. And that gives 
us um, something to jump into. Um, there are lots of opportunities with sentence frames and imagery, making vocabulary matches. Um, and again, remembering that there's those levels of WIDA with respect to the ELD content, and then even challenges within the um, newcomer lessons that we expand grammar, we expand uh, sentence structure and difficulty. So we're um, expanding language development. Um, and then don't forget that that with the formative assessment pieces, Seesaw has added in this a layer of data. So now you're able to look on the opposite side of the lesson and say, yes, these kids got it. They're ready to move on. Nope, I need to do a reteach with these students because the data is instantaneous through the formative assessment piece. Um, students listen and then they record their voice using not only vocabulary, but the grammar structure. So it might be singular versus plural. It might be adding a conjunction in the middle of the sentence to make the sentence more complex. Um, they're following along a process um, of how um, testing happens in the language development uh, process. Um, so it's really powerful. It's slow release to get students to the ability to actually exit out of language learning programs. So in our state, it models the LPAC testing. Great, and I know uh, Kia was one of our experts uh, consulting when we're developing this content to support multilingual learners. So thank you for that as well. Um, I wanna shift a little bit to talk about some challenges and solutions that, that you have expertise in. And when you think of multilingual learners, what are some of the common challenges you face when supporting them? And how, how have you addressed them? And Bridget, we'll start with you. Well, um, I think one of the biggest things is vocabulary gap. And also then due to diverse experiences and backgrounds, um, we see um, really gap, big gaps. And then how are you trying to focus and bridge that gap for students? So um, we're really trying to create really targeted lessons. I'm using the ones that Seesaw already did, but also then thinking, um, about multiple activities that they could do over and over when it goes with, I worked with some schools with their new adopted um, reading materials so that they could have also not only the work that was being done in with their ELL program, but also then not making a bigger gap within the classroom and with the curriculum resources in there. So, um, and with that, we did used their teacher voice. The teachers did that so that those were voices that they were familiar with. Um, and it, we used all the interactive components, the assessments like Cheryl talked about in the data. So what's really powerful too, is you can take some of the awesome lessons from the Seesaw library and they're structured so well, and then kind of adapt them to some specific needs within maybe your community, um, within what the child or the children or families need. Um, so that's been a really exciting process to be a part of. And it benefited not only um, our ELL learners, but it benefited other populations of students too, because they also needed that vocabulary piece. And that goes then with anchor charts in the room, um, having manipulatives and things to move around. So that's one way that we've really tried to enhance um, that growth is because vocabulary is that barrier. Yeah, and I think when we talked earlier too, Bridget, you were just talking about that importance of independent practice opportunities and ongoing opportunities yes. for practice. Mm -hmm. um, because I think sometimes in classrooms, it's okay, we, we've talked about this, let's go to the next thing. But I think with, with multilingual learners and honestly, lots of students as well, that independent practice and giving them time to continuing to record their voice or re-record or try it once again is really, really important as well. Uh, Kia, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges um, and solutions? With yeah. Team? So in my experience, most of the, the challenges um, related to multilingual learners have absolutely nothing to do with the students, but <laughs> the materials um, that we put in front of them and just making sure that they are appropriate um, for students to both make sure that they are exposed to great level content, um, but in a way that's being scaffolded for their language proficiency. 
Um, and so we have to keep both of those things in mind. And by no means am I saying this is easy, but we wanna just make sure that we're meeting both the language and, and content needs um, of students. So, you know, prior to teaching a lesson, making sure that the, the materials are available for students, um, getting to know our students and knowing what it means to be at these uh, different stages of language acquisition, um, and of course that takes time. So, you know, day one, you're not gonna know everything uh, about a student just from what you get on paper, but really getting to know them, know, getting to know their strengths um, and, and working towards those really helps us to make sure that we're meeting students where they are and that we're um, helping them to move along in, in both arenas, um, both content um, and language, because they're just bringing so many great experiences and assets to the classroom, we wanna make sure that we're, we're leveraging them with the materials that we use. And speaking of challenges, there's one that we definitely have to keep in mind, but sometimes it has to do with the mindset of the teacher. Um, it, sometimes there's a, an idea of, oh, ELD is pull out, so I don't have to deal with that because the child is getting everything they need from this special program. Um, and then there's other instances where we have school sites that are now starting to see many newcomers that up until recently haven't had much of a multilingual population. And now there's a student who's, a, who's a multilingual and learning English and they're in a native speaking class. And the teacher may have kind of developed a fixed mindset about how they approach teaching because there's been a, a lack of consistent experience. They're not being challenged frequently enough with the uh, uh, multilingual students in their classroom. Um, and it's, it's a teacher situation of needing to reactivate knowledge. Um, and from a coaching perspective, that is something that is a, an ongoing model of encouraging those pieces. So whatever you do, we have to keep this mindset. Whatever you do for your multilingual learners, it benefits everyone. I think we get so fixed in our focus of, oh, I don't have any multilingual learners in my classroom, but sentence frames and scaffolding and realia, all of these multimodal pieces are good for everyone, even for the student who seems to be above the bar on everything academically. You pull in multimodal things and their learning takes off even more so. Um, so maybe we've even been holding them back thinking, oh, they've already got it where they can be pushed farther. So teachers may need to polish up on their skills to provide adequate experiences and accommodations. Um, maybe teacher has just, you know, this slid a little bit on using sentence frames or scaffolds. And now we just need to reawaken those skills so that they can um, serve their multilingual um, learners. Yeah, those are great points. And I think moving into our next topic, which is about assessment, I want to explore a little bit ways that you are adapting assessments to accurately measure the progress and achievement of multilingual learners. Uh, Kia, what advice do you have for us? Yeah, I, I really think this has been a theme throughout our panel today um, as we, we talked about it within instruction. Um, but as we move to assessment, just making sure that we allow students to show what they know in different ways and that it doesn't have to always be a standard assessment, whether that be, you know, pencil and paper or, or on the screen. And so it can be, you know, them submitting a presentation, a, a recording, um, a drawing. Um, but one of the key pieces to know what you want students to be able to show in, in order to um, assess how they're growing is to just think about the language um, that's presented in assessments so that we can anticipate any scaffolds that might be needed um, and to really make sure that students understand what's being asked of them because many times students don't perform um, or you know respond appropriately to a prompt or um, to a particular assessment because they don't understand the questions being asked um, or the, the expectations for them. So making sure that um, they understand what's being asked of them and that the products that they produce can be scaffolded. So there may be a student that will be writing an essay as a response 
versus another student who is giving two sentences in, in the instance of um, if we want a written response. There may be one student that I want you um, and your group to you know, come up with a play around this particular idea and a role play. And then an, another student that you know, can just um, record their responses um, for that. So that, that needs to be individualized as we think about our multilingual learners, because again, we wanna meet them where they are and then help them to grow um, as they're increasing their language proficiency. And I think with that, we also need to think about um, that universal design for learning. And are we also as educators, this is the mindset, Cheryl, modeling alternative ways to show learning. So um, having some camera issues, I'm gonna close that off for a minute. So if we really think about, um, also some of our newcomers don't know what we mean by role playing. So are we even doing that our, ourselves or letting other kids show them other ways to really see what ways they can do to assess? Are we giving them modeling clay and paints and, but also doing that in a non-academic time, even like the seesaw tools so that they enjoy doing the videos and then they can use that same, they don't have, the cognitive load is not on the process. It's really showing what they want to learn or to show what they've learned. So that's something key that we really work on in my role is do even the teachers know about those alternative ways to offer and are they modeling them so that the kids can be empowered to do them too. Yeah. Um. I think from an assessment standpoint, I would probably want to um, showcase Seesaw way more than it gets showcased in my district. Um, I think probably the biggest piece is that there are different response features. So you've got the multimodal piece, but then there's also the scaffolding of pre-recorded voice to support vocabulary, sentence frames, et cetera. Um, so I'm thinking about a, a student who may be able to listen and um, complete a full sentence. They answer the question, they can record themselves, no issue, or they write the full sentence. But then you may have another student who's gonna listen. They're gonna plug a vocabulary picture into the sentence. They're gonna listen a couple of times to the frame and the word that they know goes with the vocabulary that they're looking for. And then they may be able to go ahead and record themselves. Seesaw has multiple access points so that you can reach all learners. And that same uh, access, multi uh, variety of access uh, features is also with respect to assessments. So just like I can teach in multi ways, multiple ways in Seesaw, I can also assess in multiple ways. And with the um, additional uh, assessment tools that have been created inside the formative assessment um, part of Seesaw, you now have so many ways to also have instant data, which is really fantastic. Coupling that with the fact that there's modeling everywhere. A teacher cannot exponentially grow themselves to the point that they can access every single student's voice every single second of the day, but they can record themselves the students can listen multiple times to the sample and then the students can also record themselves and the teacher has the ability to listen to them. You have exponential access points that happen when you start using a multimodal tool like Seesaw when you are teaching and assessing in the classroom. Yeah, and I think that We've talked about so many topics, uh, so so many tools uh, and supports that we can provide for our multilingual learners. But I do also want to include families in this conversation. And I think when we're we're talking about multilingual learners, we had mentioned just a couple times earlier. Bridget had shared how how do you get to know the families, and how do we make sure that they are in the loop and part of this this learning journey as well. So how do you involve families in supporting the education of multilingual learners? Um, well, definitely communication with the home is key. And so as, as much as we can let families know about the different units that students are engaged in, the topics they're exploring in, in their content area or at their grade level, 
um, and what materials are available, not only in the classroom, but allowing students to take materials home. This gives them those additional opportunities to use language and, and talk about um, the content that they're learning, what they're excited about. Um, they can explain it to a parent, a sibling, a friend, just what they're learning in a classroom and make any connections um, to home as well. And this, again, can just really give them the opportunity to showcase what they're excited about learning about, what they, what's coming up. Um, you know, we'll have our, our families that have students at different grade levels and the fifth graders telling the third grader about what's going on. And I can't wait to get to fifth grade because that's something that I'm going to engage in, um, you know, as the third grader. So just really building that communication and, and keeping everyone in the loop. And I, I think it's important to know about the literacy background of our families. Um, oral language develops first. So it might just be that they only can, they know their language only orally. Um, being aware of having older children in the family, always be the interpreter. I've had that experience a lot and that's a heavy lift because they're also an English language learner too. Mm -hmm. um, there's been some things in the chat about translations and knowing what technology does with translations and how many languages. Um, Seesaw does a great job with that piece. Um, but like Google Docs, you can use voice typing to speak in the native language and there's a translate and you can translate it to English, um, which is helpful on that teacher end um, and allow students to videotape in their native language and let them that be their information home. I don't necessarily have to access that all the time, but let them have that opportunity or do podcasts and share the family connections with Seesaw to other family members in their native language. And just that could be their weekly what's up with your school week, but in their native language. These are all really great idea with ideas. And we are, um, I, I think one of you mentioned that we're actually really lucky to be teaching in this time period. And I yeah. agree with that. There are many challenges right now, but we have a lot of benefit from um, technologies that are emerging that are supporting our multilingual learners. I think the big things to keep in mind are that we wanna make sure that the tools are translating for our multilingual learners, both um, written and verbal, so that if a person is not literate in their language that they're bringing, to, bringing with them, that they can listen to the language being spoken. Um, our district has um, sought out platforms that do have supports in as many languages as, as possible so that communication between home and school and uh, district classroom sites, you, all of that can be very um, uh, easy for anyone to access. Um, when students post um, in Seesaw, their families have this ability to see everything and then they can actually peek into the learning of the day. But we've got these direct translation pieces within Seesaw that support not only the English development, but embraces the fact of the other languages that the families are bringing to our school setting. Um, the last piece is, is that I, we just have this diversity that's coming our way. We need to be um, a really aware of the fact that if we don't have translators available, there are a lot of tips, tricks and resources out there that can help us. But we also need to vet them and make sure that the dialect that we're getting is the correct dialect that the people um, are speaking. Um, and I just shout out an, a quick example. Um, Translate by that, that big Google company is based in Spain Spanish and it does not directly translate to the many dialects of Spanish in Central and South America. So lots get lost, uh, lots of things get lost in translation. I think there's a Moody in there somewhere. Um, but it's very important to be aware of dialect and how that may or may not um, get the message that we intend to our families. Um, so technology is great. Make sure you vet your technology. Yes, and I, I know we have another question prepared, but I, I want to actually hand it off to those that are attending live with us here today and make sure that they have an opportunity to ask their questions. And my colleague, Emily, has been in the chat and in the Q&A. 
looking through questions and I know she's got some great ones queued up for us. Yes, there were so many phenomenal questions that came in and so many that were actually answered that I had put aside. But there is one from Katie Dunfield and she asked, how do you encourage educators to balance technology tools that can translate in helping students acquire the English language? So what is that balance between, you know, encouraging educators to use those technology tools, but also uh, giving students an opportunity to practice using English without just using like a translator? I, I think that goes along with um, a little bit of what we've been talking about of lessening scaffolds over time um, and letting students know what's available to them and that what's a, a support for them, but also as the educator looking at, okay, I think you might be depending on that too much. Can I think I've seen you um, progress and I think that you can you know, do this assignment without um, that support or let's just try it and see and then if we need to come back to it. And it's also part of a, a bigger conversation around balancing technology and education just in general, right? We want to have all of the, the wonderful technology tools that we have available, but then there we have to actually talk to each other and have conversations and, um, you know, do all of those things as well. So it's definitely a fine line of thinking about how the, those tools are utilized and, and scaffolding them down over time. One thing I've seen is that it's specified by the teacher beforehand. I'm dealing with that with like AI tools. It's you may use these tools for this level. So you're kind of, as you get used to them, like, and you know your student, like, mm, do you really need that translation tool? We're first gonna try it without it. Or you may use these tools. So it gives them some parameters as well. And it's not totally wild, wild west. Thank you. We have another question from Allison Phillips. Uh, how can we help convince reluctant teachers of the importance of multilingual students speaking to one another in their native languages? I think that goes back to, you know, the first question that this panel uh, was was discussing is how how are we creating an atmosphere in the classroom that feels inclusive and allows students to to share Cheryl, i don't know if you have some thoughts on this one in particular you know my my gut says um we live in a we live in a global society and we need to value each and every one's perspective that they bring and by not allowing students that speak a common language other than English in your classroom to speak is not valuing them as students, as individuals, human beings. I think that it would be very easy to set parameters. Okay, right now we're not going to because we're working on, on our sentence frames in, in this lesson with English, but you don't shut that down because you're gonna shut down the learner and that's not, it's never acceptable. Thank you for that. We have another question from Claudia who said, in my school and many schools in the Middle East, and I, this is relevant to all schools, ELL students are viewed as students with special needs, which I don't really agree with. I would love to know your opinion and advice on this. I, I'm going to jump in. I, I, I have to. We all have special needs. Some of us are not as artistic. Some of us are not as good as math. Some of us are not really great at public speaking. I am not a physical fitness kind of person. I would have been learned. I would have been learning challenged in every PE class in my life. But if you come at it from the lens that we all are learning, and that's okay, you have to change a, a culture in the way we approach education. No one is perfect. We are all learning. And I think one of the biggest pieces is for adults to humble themselves and to talk openly about their own shortcomings, what they're not good at, what they struggle with in the learning environment. Because the more we model our own difficulties, the more our students understand that we're not all going to be lucky to be perfect. Wow. And we have to challenge ourselves and not give up. It's called grit and perseverance. 
And they're all really great character traits, regardless of where you live in the world. Absolutely. And and I'd also just like to add that as we think about our multilingual learners, these are students who will at some point no longer need this level of support. When they have a fully acquired the language, when they have exited whatever you know ass assessment tool you use to progress with the language, they will no longer need those supports, um, which may be different from how we categorize students with disabilities who will potentially, depending on the disability, need um, those supports for for quite some time or throughout their educational careers. And so there's a, a distinct difference between learning a language. We, we would all be language learners if we were dropped in a college classroom in a language that we um, have never been exposed to. But that doesn't mean that we necessarily have a, a disability. Um, that, that we'll need support with. We just need support with the language acquisition. I know just as much about mathematics um, as I do right now in English and Swahili. I just don't have the language to be able to express that. And I think I would add um, looking at the Universal Design for Learning Framework from CAST, um, looking at the term learner variability, because that is all of us, Mm -hmm. And um, the myth of average, which talks about that variability with all of us. Thank you so much. This was such an enlightening session. There are so many great conversations happening in the chat. Make sure to continue having these conversations. We have a networking center where you can continue uh, collaborating and learning best practices from other educators. Um, your PD certificate for this session will be emailed to you. There are still a few more sessions happening today, but before you leave, we are going to do a giveaway. And again, for the giveaway, I will be contacting you early next week. There is nothing you have to do. I have your emails when you registered. It is spinning our winners. They are on the screen, Christina and Lindsay. Congratulations. Uh, don't forget there are so many other opportunities to win by engaging and connecting with other people. You are earning points for the leaderboard. The top 50 will uh, all get prizes. Thank you so much for joining our session today and we look forward to seeing you in other sessions happening today and tomorrow. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.